Good afternoon and welcome to today's program titled Beyond Trauma, Proven and Effective Applications for EMDR. I'm Tom Valentino, Senior Editor of Addiction Professional. Today's program is co-sponsored by Foundations Recovery Network and Decision Point. Thank you to our sponsors and to our audience for giving us your time and attention today. Before we get started, we have a few details we'd like to go over. To submit a question or a technical issue, please use the Q&A area below the slides at any time. You do not have to wait until the end of the program to ask a question. To download a copy of the presentation, please click the link in the Resources tab to the right of your slides. A special note about CE credit, to get your CE, you must watch the program all the way through the Q&A section at the end of the presentation. At the end, do not leave the web page. The site will automatically redirect you to a survey, and this survey must be completed in order to generate your CE certificate. For those watching in a group, please download the group submission guide in the resources tab and follow the instructions provided. Please note CE credit is not available for the archived webinar. It is only available for the live event. And finally, for those of you who are on Twitter, please tweet along with us today using our hashtag APLiveWebinar. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Gary Heese. Gary received his master's degree in marriage and family therapy from the University of Houston Clear Lake. Gary has been licensed in Texas and now Arizona for 15 years. During that time, he has worked with adolescents, adult co-occurring disordered clients in hospitals, a partial hospital program and outpatient therapy, and in a private therapeutic boarding school. Thank you, Gary, for taking the time to speak with us today. And with that, the audience is yours. Thank you, Tom. Hello to everyone. Uh, today we're going to talk about EMDR in some less traditional ways than probably that particular modality is thought of. Um, I happened uh, into this field, uh, changed careers in midlife, and decided... Uh, a lot of that was based on working with people uh, who had extensive trauma histories. Uh, by far, I have found EMDR to be the most effective and efficacious, as well as the most efficient way uh, to address the hyperarousal of the brain and uh, the, the overly emotive response uh, to trauma memories by allowing people to process uh, those issues. So, uh, going into EMDR, uh, we're just going to talk about the basics for a moment, and we're going to look at defining it, the basics about it, how it works, those sorts of things. If you're EMDR trained, this may be a little boring, but it's good to get the basics down because every other protocol that's used for applications besides directly addressing trauma are founded on the principles we're going to cover now. So, extensively researched, the Department of Defense gives and shows EMDR as a treatment of choice uh, for PTSD, and indeed it's known for the treatment of PTSD and trauma. Basically, it's a set of standardized protocols, and it utilizes bilateral stimulation, eye movements, uh, the uh, vibratory uh, little attachments that you can get and hold in either hand, or tapping in order to stimulate the passage of information between the hemispheres of the brain. It's helped lots of people with psychological stress. Part of my interest in trauma was that I was a trauma patient myself. While I retain all the memories of what happened, what has been relieved is the um, emotional response 
to things that were similar to that or what we usually call triggers. That is what has become very much more manageable, particularly through the application of EMDR. So, basically, it's a very client-centered approach. In the EMDR, you aren't instructing the client. You aren't telling the client what to do. Rather, the client's responses are actually guiding a session in which you are a facilitator uh, rather than the director. Francine Shapiro made a chance observation that eye movements reduce the intensity of disturbing thoughts. And basically, she formulated what is called the Adaptive Information Processing Model. And we'll talk about that in a little, a little more in just a moment. So, EMDR today, heavily researched, shown to be extremely successful, adopted by the DOD, but it has lots of applications besides just PTSD, on which, by the way, it's highly effective. That adaptive information processing model posits that memories and experiences, especially the emotive part of the experience, get stuck in the brain and are incomplete in that they don't really process out and the brain doesn't adapt to them. This is familiar to many of us who work with trauma. We know uh, that some, most of the people we work with in extremely traumatic situations simply have no mechanism with which to cope with that much stress at that moment. And when that happens, the encoding takes place in the brain as a fight or flight or a survival type of response. Therefore, you run into people who are experiencing trauma, who talk a great deal to you, usually, about um, uh, everyone, about an event happening, and what they notice is that people around them are going, wow, that was really disturbing. But they are experiencing the event on a hypothetical scale of 1 to 10 at about an 8 or a 9. And this is due to that information having not been processed and being re-triggered within the mind of the trauma uh, survivor and them experiencing that same emotive response that they did in the original event. So, I don't like reading slides, but the things I want to tell you are the real cornerstones of EMDR is the three-pronged protocol. What happened in the past, what's going on in the present, and what do you want to have happen in the future. And it utilizes elements from lots of other approaches. Psychodynamics, the intrapsychic conflict. Dysfunctional beliefs and behaviors. And those of you who have worked with trauma survivors know that when that trauma reaction is, is touched off, there is, without being able to reduce the emotive response to that trauma reaction, there is very little that can be done on a logical basis in the moment. The foundation of the problem in the view of EMDR is unprocessed memories of disturbing events, again, that are dysfunctionally stored within the neural networks. So when an event like that happens, the natural system for processing a memory and coping with all of that information is interrupted because of high arousal. So when present day uh, experiences uh, occur, they can activate 
a survival level feeling and response coming out of stored memory. In individuals who are healthy, right, they do fairly well within with things that sometimes even border on the extreme. Their coping mechanisms are in place. There's a belief in their own integrity of self, etc. But when you deal with an individual who hasn't developed those things, who may not have an innate sense of identity, who may not have an innate faith in their own sanity and perception of events, you can get a more elevated emotional response. And that can short circuit the brain's normal way to process information. So, again, I won't read to you, but Bessel van der Kolk, a quote from him and Fissler at the top. And I call your attention to the bottom paragraph. That experience of trauma remaining frozen and the re-experience of it through intrusive thoughts, negative emotions, and negative self-beliefs occurs on a repetitive basis. EMDR, because of the bilateral stimulation, seems to stimulate that frozen information and allows it to process through. The eye movements and other forms of bilateral stimulation make this process function. So, what do we do? We want to access the dysfunctionally stored information. We want to stimulate the system. We want to move the information within the brain. And we want to desensitize people to it. Eye movement desensitization, right? And reprocessing. The desensitization is done using what is called a SUD a subjective unit of distress. And you get a ranking on the SUD and what the client is experiencing uh, by simply questioning them at different points in the EMDR process. The reprocessing can take place as the emotional level comes down through desensitization and the, the uh, survivor is able to process events and understand them as well as reduce their emotional response to them. And this is the future part of EMDR processing, shifting negative cognitions in the past to desired positive cognitions in the future. So the client generates corrective information. And this is very important, guys. The therapist in EMDR doesn't reflect or interpret or reframe or intervene in traditional ways. And by the way, I'm level two trained in EMDR. Um, uh, I was quite fascinated with it uh, and its successes. Um, the only time that there's anything vaguely like traditional therapy utilizing EMDR is once you are trained to level two in EMDR, you begin to use cognitive interweaves. Inter, inner Basically, they're posed in the form of a question that the client can answer. Otherwise, most of the time, your responses to what's going on with the client or just notice what you're seeing and feeling. Or the client tells you, this is what I'm seeing, this is what I'm feeling about it, and you simply say, go with that and continue 
with bilateral stimulation, be it eye movements, be it the buzzies held in the hand, be it tapping. Okay? Cognitive interweaves come out and sound like this. A therapist might look at someone who says, I felt so responsible, I should have been able to help my mom. A cognitive interweave that you might say back to the client would be something like, Do, is it the job of a 10-year-old to make things all right for their mom? To which most of the time the client will answer no, and you would then look at them and say, go with that and begin bilateral stimulation again. Letting that information enter in and become part of their cognition about events that happened in the past. So there's an eight phase pro protocol. You see it here. Again, the purpose of the seminar is really to explain this in detail. You process the past event by identifying core memories. You process the present event, the current triggers and stressors, and then you process the future event. What would they like to think, feel, and what would they like their actions to be in the future? And by doing that, rather than measuring their distress, you measure their belief in being able to do something different in the future. Typically, it's a 90-minute session. Number of processing sessions varies based on the client, the trauma history, the issues, etc. When you're dealing with complex PTSD, which is repeated instances of trauma over a period of time, you're probably going to utilize more sessions. When you're dealing with a single traumatic event, lots of times it's only one to four. Uh, let's talk about a client. For instance, you get a 40-year-old man who was laid off during the economic restructuring of his company. He's fighting with his children and sometimes his wife. Negative cognitions. I'm not good enough to, re to uh, be retained at my company, so they let me go. I'm worthless. The positive cognition. I have value to offer and can find an organization that recognizes this about me. So, Megan, let's go to the next slide. So, it's not a cure-all or a magic bullet, but for lots of people, it brings some degree of relief, and for many people, it brings an astounding level of, of uh, relief. Listed on the page are some of the things that EMDR has been used for and applied to. For instance, addictions dissociative disorders. Although dissociative disorders, you have to be extremely careful because in most cases, dissociative disorders are actually a rule out for using EMDR. Even performance enhancement. So some of what we use EMDR for here at Decision Point, I'm going to be going over. So next slide. All right, guys. The feeling state addiction protocol is predicated on addictions being created when a desired feeling and a given behavior become associated together. Now, for those of you with some experience in mindfulness-based stress reduction uh, and mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, you'll notice that the very same theoretical underpinnings are applying to the feeling state addiction protocol, which basically when you use MBCT, most of the time you're addressing depression, and you're addressing the fact that people will get depressed when they have certain cognitions arise, because those cognitions, they have connected in their mind to a depressed feeling. The feeling state addiction protocol operates very much the same way. A very intense desired feeling plus a positive effect by using, develops into an addictive fixation or feeling state. Next slide, Megan. 
That addiction can be triggered by an internal or external stimulus. And what that yields is, hey, I'm having this feeling. An event has happened which reminds me of the cognitions around using. And boom, I do addictive behavior. Next slide, Megan. So, the feeling state theory is based on positive feelings having been linked with specific objects or behavior. And what they form is a state-dependent memory that the brain responds to. The state-dependent memory is composed of feelings in the event, and that forms what we call a feeling state. Feelings are defined as the totality of the sensations, emotions, and thoughts, right? So the creation of a feeling state is very similar to the way traumatic memories become fixated. So next slide. So let me tell you how we utilize the feeling state addiction protocol here at Decision Point. We find a couple of circumstances existing with almost every substance abuse uh, client who we get in our milieu. One of two, either they don't think it's very serious, which is your traditional uh, uh, position of denial on the part of the client, or they understand the seriousness of it, the impact on the people around them who they care about, and they are beset by huge feelings of guilt and shame and remorse. And many of us who work uh, within with substance abusing individuals are familiar with this. The person literally goes into a period of self-flagellation, of beating themselves up on a regular basis, and even into negative grandiosity about how bad they actually were and how badly they behaved. The truth is, with the client fixated on those issues, they're not ready to go to work on how their addiction was created, how they were set up to be vulnerable to it, and how they can process things differently in the future in order to not behave the same way. So, when our clients come in, all of them spend the first two weeks, uh, two, not the first two weeks, but all of them spend time in a feeling state addiction protocol group once a week for those first two weeks. And within a group setting, we process those feelings of shame, guilt, and utter remorse. We help them let go of those so they can begin immediately to pay close attention to the tools that we're trying to give them and to working on the issues that set them up for addiction in the first place. So what you get is a cognitive change. Once that fixated feeling state is reprocessed, the rationalizations and justifications to support the out-of-control behavior, they're not needed anymore and they begin to subside. Also, in tandem with that, the behavioral changes begin to take place. Self-destructive behaviors begin to subside, and they begin to seek appropriate ways to obtain the desired feeling. Next slide, Megan. So in the first station, session with the Feeling State Addiction Protocol, we look at these points. We have the client combine that image of behavior, the positive feeling, and the physical sensations. Now, lots of people think that this is counter, but it's not. Literally, when you're in a feeling state addiction protocol session, you are asking the client to vicariously re-experience the very feelings of being high that they have had before. And then utilizing EMDR protocols to break the connection 
between the experience of feeling high and the behaviors that they had in the past. Next slide, Megan. So, we even assign homework to experience that behavior in your mind and judge your progress. How severe are the cravings? Surprisingly, not surprisingly to us anymore, but surprisingly, when you use the feeling state addiction protocol, you have multiple people who begin to, to spontaneously imagine other ways to feel that goodness, that quote-unquote high feeling that are appropriate and that aren't involved with utilizing substances. So in the second session, we reevaluate the behavior. We reevaluate how intense the feelings are. And we process using the standardized EMDR protocol. Now, we're going to talk about dysfunctional positive effect, but before I go, literally, we have clients who look up at us and tell us that they cannot re-arouse that feeling that they've had before, that they cannot access it, that their brain gives them positive ways to have that feeling rather than the use of drugs and other substances. So, Megan, are you on dysfunctional positive effect? Yep. Let's go to next slide. Now, all of us have had a client who looks at us and they go, man, I really need to work on this issue, but I'm just too afraid. The most effective way to address this issue instead of looking at them and saying, well, you know, you've got to do that, you've got to go through the discomfort in order to get the benefit, et cetera, pretty traditional cognitive uh, CBT techniques, look at them, rather address the issue and target the feeling of relief associated with avoiding that problem. This isn't used to force a client to work on an issue they don't want to work. It is used with clients who have an avoidance impulse that they can identify they really don't want to have. Next slide. This is partially derived from Popke's detour process. Okay? Avoidant behaviors are maintained and reinforced by the stress relief associated with avoiding. That's actually the reward. So instead of doing scaling on distress, we do scaling 1 to 10 on the level of urge to avoid. So it uses Popke's approach to address the mental tactics that some clients use to avoid disturbing material. So you create an image of what's to be avoided. You scale the image 1 to 10. Determine where the urge to avoid is in the body, and then do bilateral stimulation. As that urge to avoid goes down, the client usually will spontaneously begin to directly address the incident that they were trying to avoid, and then you switch over to standard EMDR protocols. Phobias. Let me tell you that the two most effective things that I have ever seen for addressing phobia are EMDR and um, hypnosis. I'm trained in Ericksonian hypnosis, trained by PM Melody, and level two trained in EMDR. Uh, hypnosis uh, and EMDR, very effective on specific phobias. So, a specific phobia. They're fearful or anxious, and they want to avoid certain objects or situations, right? 
It's a specific cognitive ideation. Okay? A fear, anxiety, or avoidance is almost always immediately induced by the phobic situa uh, situation. And how can you tell? An intensity of a reaction way out of scale for what's going on. You can have animals. Uh, one that I remember is a therapist who worked for me at a different uh, organization uh, here in Arizona had an absolute phobia to tarantulas. Well, tarantulas are a feature of Arizona. And literally, she was able to successfully work on that avoidance phobia through the application of EMDR until she actually was able to allow one of the spiders to walk onto her hand. Now, my apologies to any of you in the audience who just shivered. But it's just a good story that illustrates how thoroughly a phobic event can be processed utilizing the tenets of EMDR. Lots of people want to do in vivo exposure, but this can induce heights and levels of reaction that are similar to a panic attack. I would much rather go at those situations utilizing EMDR or, in my case, hypnosis. What about EMDR and couples therapy? We literally can connect a trauma model around relationships within this application with Bowen's concept of differentiation. Those of you who have done couples therapy, we all know the old saying, the problems with a couple very often is that figuratively, it's not the couple, it's the couple and each one's mom and dad and maybe even extended family that are in the relationship through past events that are still carried. That it creates impacts on any kind of relationship. And if you have a couple where one or both have experienced trauma, it's almost inevitable inevitable that they're going to become highly reactive. So I'll let you read the quote. It's from the Bowen Institute. And especially that last sentence, guys. The level of self rarely changes unless a person makes a structured and long-term effort to change it. The other benefit of doing couples EMDR is the level of understanding that it creates between the partners. You know what happens with couples, those of you who have worked with couples. They get into something, an event happens, you and I would objectively look at it and say, well, gosh, on a scale of 1 to 10, I'd be disturbed at a level of about 2 by that event. But not in the case of the couple. It rapidly escalates, and it rapidly turns into a battle royal of who's going to be right. So in couples therapy, EMDR clinicians look for generalized effects a lower state of arousal and less reactivity that give both of these people who love each other a much better chance to address each other in a constructive way. It's an excellent book edited by Marilyn Luber and contains all of these protocols that can be utilized by you once you are level two trained in EMDR. And I would recommend that you be trained by the EMDR Institute as well. Recent Traumatic Events Protocol. Guys, this protocol was come up with in Israel. Uh, it was come up with and used uh, with people who uh, were the subject of terrorist incidents or rocket attacks. Uh, it was designed to short-circuit the development 
of post-traumatic stress disorder by immediately addressing a traumatic event uh, on a fairly on a fairly uh, current basis. What we find here, those of us who work with substance abuse abusing individuals, we know that they experience losses both in family and friends. Most of the time when we are using the recent traumatic events protocol, we are processing with a client who's present in our milieu who might otherwise look up and say, my best friend died, I have to leave treatment now, and endanger themselves by doing that. Instead, we offer them an opportunity to process that with us in a very, very efficient way that allows them to do normal grieving without, without some of the negative beliefs and the impulses to leave what amounts to a safe environment in the middle of their treatment. Here's key terms associated with RTEP. The traumatic incident, it has multiple points of disturbance, which we call pods. And in many times, these can be specific memories of specific things happening. There's a narrative that the person can tell you, and they tell the story out loud with continuous bilateral stimulation. Recounting details is really discouraged. The idea here is to do the processing with bilateral stimulation in order to help them move past the traumatic event. We adapt the eight phases, and we utilize the protocol that you see here on each point of disturbance that's related to the original traumatic episode. And for instance, a point of disturbance, let's say someone was in an incidence of war or an attack of some kind. They may have a point of disturbance where they see uh, a piece of their home flying through the air due to an explosion. They may have a point of disturbance where they see someone they care about knocked flat uh, on the ground by concussion. All of those can be various points of disturbance that are directly addressed using the, re the recent traumatic events protocol. And then we follow up just as we do in EMDR. This is done in a group format. There is no narrative that's done at all. We install resources utilizing earth, air, wind, and fire. You can Google that and find it is a process established by Alon Shapiro. We address today's date and install resources. We go in the past and draw a picture, and you'll see the worksheet in just a second, of uh, on a worksheet that's there and date it when the actual event happened. You also draw out the positive resources and fill out the desired future positive cognition. Now, all this will make a little sense. Let's go to the next slide. And guys, you should be seeing the EMDR GTEP worksheet. You see the blocks on the lower half. On the left is the past date, and that is where you draw the picture of the past event. On the right, is your present safety, and that's where you may write or draw the resources that you have to help you. In the upper left-hand corner are resources you have had in the past. In the middle, you will identify the points of disturbance within that traumatic event, those points that are indelibly 
uh, printed on your brain. And you can either write a narrative or draw a picture under pod one, two, three, etc. And in the top right hand corner, you will actually put what the desired future will be, wh how, what you will experience when thinking about these events and where you'll go. So next slide. So what we do is Google search, and all that really means is that's a cute term for going inside and identifying what the points of disturbance are by what your brain presents you. But you do that while you're tapping the worksheet with one hand going back and forth between past and future. The bottom two boxes on the left and right hand side with your hand while following the hand with your eyes. So you get double bilateral stimulation. They get a pod and they draw or write it. Then they do three sets of bilateral stimulation. They refocus and see how disturbed they are and process until the disturbance goes down. Next slide. So you see the worksheet again just reminding you of what's going on. And through permission from Alon Shapiro, I have a video that we're going to present. And that video uh, will actually uh, tell us about this and will illustrate how it can be used. What we're going to be doing is watching how we're able to process and let other feelings take the place of the traumatic feeling that in essence is outshining, if you will, all other feelings that are going on. So, after people do group traumatic events protocol, honest to God, guys, we have an Embryo consultant who does this for us here at uh, Decision Point. She tells us the common negative cognitions are variations on I'm not enough. And the common responses, if you'll pardon me, guys, are WTF, this is weird, what did you do to me? That's how effective uh, this particular protocol can be. And on this slide you can see four different responses that have come back from our people here at Decision Point after completing GTAP protocol. The next slide is the Elon Shapiro video. And guys, hopefully this will touch you as well as illustrate to you the use of the GTAP protocol. This was filmed in a Syrian refugee camp uh, and was filmed after uh, a team went in uh, through the uh, uh, through IMDRIA and uh, the ER, EMDR International Association in order to do GTAP processing with persons who had experienced extreme events. Uh, please watch and I hope it is as informative and inspirational to you as it is to me. Megan, take it away.
Evet, sabahleyin çok kötüydüm ama şimdi kendimi hissediyorum diye. Ay çok mutluyum ya. İçimden hanım bir mutluluk geldi. Ne güzel. Ben de yani yanımda şaka. Çok teşekkür ediyorum. Kalbimle size e, teşekkür ediyorum. Bütün kalbimizle diyor. Sizlere teşekkür ediyorum. Siz bizden fazla yorulduğumuz için biz daha da kalpten içten size teşekkür ediyoruz. Sağ olun. Her şey ne olursa olsun ben razıyım. İyi bir şey. Ben razıyım. Çok güzel. Çok güzel. Çok güzel. Çok güzel. Çok güzel. Çok güzel. Çok güzel. Çok güzel. Çok güzel. Çok güzel. Çok güzel. Çok güzel. Çok her şeyden önce çok teşekkür ederim abi. Bize düşünce gördüğünüz, kulak gördüğünüz, hayat gördüğünüz gibi bir şey. Gelin bir daha yaşamak için. Evet. İlk ayın süresinde kurulardık anlamın içinde. Ama ilk defa beden ve zihinler olarak. Kalya halk ıhtıya alt. Bir, iki, üç. Okay, this is your moderator, Tom. Gary, we want to say thanks for a very informative presentation. Um, before we get into the Q&A portion of our event today, I'd like to turn things over to Sarah Tortorella from Foundations for a few words from our sponsor. Thank you, Tom. Here at Foundations Recovery Network, our grassroots movement called Heroes in Recovery has a simple mission, to eliminate the social stigma that keeps addicted individuals from seeking help and to create an engaged, sober community that empowers people to give back and live healthy, active lives. Join us in this mission at our 6K race series at these locations across the country. As a thank you for your attendance today, please enjoy the discount code WEBINAR2017 to register for any future 6K events. Back to you, Tom. All right, thanks a lot, Sarah. We've already had a number of questions coming in from our audience. However, we would like to remind you that you can use the Q&A area below the slides to submit a question at any time. Also, to download a copy of the slides, please click the Resources tab to the right of the presentation window. All right, let's get into some questions here. Uh, Gary, we had a member of our audience ask, how can one bill for this procedure in an office-based practice? Uh, what that is, is an ancillary service code. Uh, that's the way we bill for it. Uh, even in an office practice, uh, when you're doing EMDR, uh, almost every insurance company out there recognizes the procedure. Uh, we have billed for it uh, on an outpatient basis at our outpatient center in Scottsdale. Uh, so uh, really, it's just a matter of getting in touch uh, with your insurance company for the procedure codes that they will accept. 
Okay. Um, would you say that this is a helpful approach for individuals with OCD symptoms? I believe I believe it is. I mean, because uh, typically the traumatic event, when it's dysfunctionally processed and gets stuck in the brain, it literally goes round and round, which is very similar to ruminations in OCD. Uh, and a lot of OCD medications have uh, some really undesirable side effects. Uh, the um, so yes, I would definitely try this. I would uh, look in Marilyn Luber's book and also go to Imdria, e m d r i a dot org, and look up research in the application uh, for obsessive compulsive disorder. Okay. How would the EMDR process look if you're working with couples whose children have been affected by family disputes and conflict in family roles? Um, I would not include uh, uh, kids in this sort of thing. Uh, the uh, I'm a big believer uh, in uh, uh, in family dynamics uh, and in uh, structural family therapy. I believe that when the parents begin to get on the same page and operate as a combined team that the benefits filter down uh, to the kids. Uh, I believe that you bring the kids to a family therapist and they talk about the impacts uh, on the kids and let them express themselves. But basically don't go into uh, the nitty gritty details of what the parents are processing they merely are able to reassure the kids uh, that the parents are working uh, on the issues that have caused conflicts before and that uh, uh, hopefully those kids are beginning to see changed behavior on the part of mom and dad that reassure them that something is going to be done to correct the situation. All right, I think that's going to be just about all the time we have for questions for today. We do have some final instructions regarding CE credit. Uh, do not leave this page. Please continue to stay on the platform, and the site will automatically redirect you to a survey. And this must be completed in order to generate your CE certificate. For those of you watching in a group, as a reminder, please download the Group Submission Guide and the Resources tab to the right of the slides and follow the instructions provided. Please note that CE credit is not available for the archived webinar. It's only available for the live event on August 29, 2017. If you enjoyed today's program, please consider joining us on September 26th for a program with John Raymond titled The Ins and Outs of Network Participation. The link to register is located in the Resources tab to the right of the presentation window. I want to thank Gary Heath once again for an excellent presentation. I would also like to thank our co-sponsors, Foundations Recovery Network and Decision Point, for making today's program possible. Finally, thank you to those of you in our audience for participating today. We hope you'll join us in the future for another Addiction Professional webinar. This concludes today's presentation. Have a great day.